afternoon and uh, we'll proceed with the next session on contaminants emerging concern and it's my pleasure to uh, introduce the moderator for the session Louisa Valiela from US EPA Region 9 where where Louisa is a senior staff person who's well known as sort of the is a true integrator of of EP, of the Clean Water Act programs including both wetlands and watershed planning and Many people around here know her because she is the she oversees the San Francisco Bay Water Quality Improvement Fund. So she is a, she doles out money. So people like her for that. And uh, coincidentally, Louisa has a has a master's degree from the University of California Berkeley, <laughs> Al Bear. So take it take it over, Louisa. Thanks, Tom. I'm, I'm very pleased to be with you all um, this afternoon to have our RMP annual meeting shift towards um, emerging contaminants. I want you to know that the irony is not lost on me that I, a representative from a regulatory agency, am introducing this next topic, uh, a series of talks on emerging contaminants, a ginormous and amorphous bundle of chemicals and compounds that are by and large unregulated. Uh, not only is this task daunting to understand what emerging contaminants are out there, the tools that we need to accurately detect them are sometimes hard to pronounce. Um, it's a challenge, but as Tom noted as he opened this meeting today, um, we need some new challenges because thanks to the investments in this long-term data set that is the RMP, we now understand how legacy pollutants are affecting our bay and can shift resources away from frequent monitoring of those to other priorities. Um, so under the Emerging Contaminants Program, specific contaminants and sometimes classes of chemicals are ranked into a risk-tiered framework. Uh, you saw a sneak peek of that um, in Miguel's talk on QACs um, in his slide that had a green, yellow, orange, and purple color-coded table. Um, the only way we can make better management decisions, and that's just another way to say take an action, regulatory or otherwise, is to have data to support those decisions. Um, science to support decisions, exactly how John Coleman put it in the previous session on sediment. And that is what our next group of uh, esteemed colleagues um, are going to share with us today. First, we'll hear from Dr. Lee Ferguson, a scientist at Duke University. Uh, then Dr. Dan Villeneuve from EPA's Office of Research and Development, and then Dr. Ezra Miller, a scientist at SFBI. Uh, let me introduce Dr. Lee Ferguson. He is an Associate Professor of Environmental Science and Engineering at Duke University in Durham, North Carolina. He received BS degrees from the University of South Carolina in Chemistry and Marine Science in 1997 before earning a PhD in Coastal Oceanography at SUNY Stony Brook in 2002. Research in the Ferguson Laboratory is focused on environmental analytical chemistry. Specifically, application of high-resolution accurate mass mass spectrometry coupled with multi-dimensional chromatographic separations bioaffinity isolation techniques, and chemoinformatic methods to detect and quantify emerging contaminants. His recent work has centered on the development of non-targeted analysis, which he will share with us today. We are extremely fortunate to have Dr. Ferguson and by extension his grad students as an expert advisor to the RMP's Emerging Contaminants Workgroup. I am going to turn it over to Lee, and I'm also going to encourage our audience um, and our listeners as the uh, talks go on today, please remember uh, you can put in any questions you have at any time into our Q&A box. Take it away. Dr. Okay. Great. Uh, thank you, Louisa. And uh, thank you all for having me. It's a real pleasure uh, to speak at the RMP meeting. I've had a long and fruitful um, working relationship with SFEI and have really enjoyed my opportunities to advise uh, the program on emerging contaminants. And so what I wanna to talk to you about today is some work that we've been doing using non-targeted chemical analysis to prioritize and identify emerging contaminants in aquatic systems. I'm gonna tell you a story about how we've been using these techniques uh, here in North Carolina where I'm based to understand the impacts of extreme weather events on uh, 
water contamination and water quality. I thought this was especially relevant to talk about given the uh, natural disasters that have been increasing due to climate change and other uh, influences across the nation and even there in uh, the Bay Area with the, with the wildfires. So uh, back in 2018, on September 14th, Hurricane Florence uh, struck eastern North Carolina. And so this uh, was really a major storm uh, that impacted the Carolinas at, at its peak before the hurricane came ashore. This storm was rated as a category four hurricane with 140 mile per hour winds. And it made landfall near Wrightsville Beach uh, here, right at the sort of corner of North Carolina, southeast corner, as a category one storm. Uh, the real problem here was that the storm is really slow moving and it caused nearly four days of continuous rain over eastern North Carolina. So the combined rain and storm surge made Hurricane Florence the wettest hurricane that's on record in the Carolinas. And it really spread a huge amount of destruction and pain across uh, the area, especially Eastern North Carolina. It was actually responsible for 15 deaths across the Carolinas. So the extreme rainfall amounts uh, are really what made this storm particularly unique uh, in terms of hurricanes. So as you see, uh, the hurricane came ashore and dumped an enormous amount of precipitation right in the southeastern corner of North Carolina. Uh, there were the wind, the story wasn't really one of wind, there were the wind speed that was clocked in uh, Jacksonville was really only in the 30 to 40 mile per hour range. But as you see, over the period of the hurricane, uh, almost three feet of rainfall uh, was recorded at Jacksonville, North Carolina. And this water really had nowhere to go. Um, and especially if you combine this, with the storm surge uh, that was about three and a half to four feet when measured at Beaufort, North Carolina here, around the same time, uh, this was really a, a squeeze of flooding from both sides, uh, from above as well as from the ocean. Uh, and it really led to inundation of many areas in the eastern part of the state that were usually completely dry. And so one of the big questions that was raised is what is the impact of this amount of flooding and this amount of inundation on mobilization of pollutants that might cause trouble with water quality uh, going forward. So um, the flooding, uh, as I said, caused a, a huge amount of inundation of homes, farms, and businesses. So here in the upper left is a map of North Carolina with the watersheds uh, colored in, in different colors here. Uh, and I'm going to primarily focus on the Noose River watershed and the Cape Fear watershed here. These are the dominant river systems that influence southeastern North Carolina. And so uh, this photo, this uh, uh, satellite photo is sort of a blow up of the area in the black box here. Uh, here's New Bern, North Carolina, right at the end of the, of the Noose River and the confluence with the Trent River here. And this is the Noose River estuary which flows into Pamlico Sound. And I'm gonna talk a bit about that today. Um, and so the cities of Trenton or towns of Trenton and Pollocksville are along the, the Trent River here, which is sort of an agriculturally dominated area. This is a satellite image before the hurricane. And then immediately after the hurricane, you can really see all this dark area uh, here along the Trent River indicates flooding. And so the, the towns of Trenton and Pollocksville were actually completely flooded and cut off uh, from the surrounding um, communities. Uh, there was really no route in or out of the city and the town at that point. And so all of this area that was agricultural land, towns, businesses, and homes were flooded and much of that water made its way down into uh, the Lower Noose River. So uh, myself and my uh, technician uh, made a road trip around North Carolina a few days after the hurricane. Uh, this is sort of some visual images of, of what we found. It was really quite dramatic and quite striking. Uh, there were many cases where businesses and homes were completely flooded. This was really three days after the hurricane uh, when the rivers were cresting, uh, so cars abandoned, uh, businesses completely inundated, and in some cases uh, we couldn't even get close enough to the rivers to actually uh, do dip sampling and had to basically wade out into floodwaters to collect our samples. As I said, all of that water has to go somewhere. So here's sort of a blow up satellite image of uh, the area right down uh, on the coast, the sort of the mi middle southern coast of uh, southeastern coast of North Carolina. And what you see is that these are the plumes of the rivers. This is uh, basically the Newport and the White Oak River and the large amount of, of natural organic matter and dissolved organic matter which is being flushed out into the ocean 
uh, through the estuaries due to this, uh, these storms. And so you can see that this bright line of blue versus sort of brown here, this is actually the Gulf Stream. So uh, these um, NOM plumes reached 50 miles offshore into the Gulf Stream uh, after the flooding. And so uh, it was really quite dramatic. Uh, the rivers overtopped their banks. Uh, at one point, all the river crossings east of I-95 were closed and nobody could get to the areas uh, and they were flooded for ne nearly two weeks. So with all that background, our objective was to conduct some water sampling uh, in these impacted areas during and after Hurricane Florence to assess the impact uh, on water quality. And so we were using some innovative methods based on high resolution uh, mass spectrometry to analyze the organic pollutants. And what really made this effort unique is our ability to utilize these advanced non-targeted analysis uh, data processing workflows to try to identify compounds and emerging pollutants that are in these floodwaters that we would ordinarily miss if we were out just doing routine monitoring. And so the secondary objective, of course, is to assess potential sources and distributions of storm-associated pollutants in these watersheds, uh, see if we can identify where these were coming from. So our sampling focused on these flooded watersheds, especially the Noose River here, and the Cape Fear uh, River here. And what's unique here is that these rivers represent very different sources of potential contaminants. The Cape Fear River is dominated by industry and urbanization up in the upper reaches of the Cape Fear around uh, Raleigh uh, and Greensboro areas. Uh, the Noose River is actually uh, dominated by agriculture. So lots of tobacco, corn, hog farming throughout the watershed. So we, uh, we did uh, sampling here. Um, before and uh, then after the hurricane. So uh, the samples were collected sort of in this map here, which I'll, I'll show throughout the presentation. Sites labeled with an N represent sites along the Noose River from the headwaters close to Raleigh up here, and then flowing all the way down to the Noose River estuary near the southeastern coast of uh, North Carolina in Pamlico Sound. The Cape Fear River on the southeastern side here flowing uh, from around Fayetteville down to Wilmington. There's a large stretch of area that we did not get samples in because we, it was completely inaccessible except by helicopter. Uh, we sampled right on 9-19-18. Uh, uh, this was September 18th, right at the crest of the flooding on the Noose River. And then we went back about a month later and grabbed samples at all the same sites um, after the flow had returned to near base. Um, I'm, I'm not going to bore you with a lot of analytical chemistry, um, but I am going to tell you that uh, really the technology here is quite critical for our ability to do this type of analysis. So we're using ultra high resolution mass spectrometry. And so the instrumentation that's utilized in this uh, type of work is designed to very accurately and very sensitively uh, isolate and characterize with, um, with extreme uh, resolution the mass spectra of a large number of organic contaminants present in samples simultaneously. So we're doing highly sensitive, highly accurate, and high throughput analysis of many individual compounds simultaneously. And that's what makes this uh, technique unique relative to your sort of standard water quality monitoring. We're actually letting the samples tell us which compounds are present instead of going out with a preconceived idea of what we're gonna look for. Uh, so why do we use high resolution mass spec for non-targeted analysis? Well, so this is just a sort of cartoon of a mass spectrum. And depending on the resolution that you use, resolution 500, 5,000, 50,000, you can see that the peaks in the spectrum get narrower and narrower. And the narrower those peaks are, the lower the accuracy that we're able to, uh, uh, or the error that we're able to measure these masses to. So as we get tighter and tighter with our resolution, our accuracy goes way up and we can discern many, many more types of compounds in our samples. So in our case, we're running with a resolution that's about half a million and we're getting a, a mass error less than one part per million. So we can measure our mass down to the fourth, or in some cases, even the fifth decimal place. And this allows us to do these, these high throughput analyses. Um, so here's the, the hard part, um, actually the data analysis. So this is kind of how the sausage is made in my lab. After we collect all of the data, the mass spectrometry is actually the easy part. The hard part is then what do you do with that data? The name of the game here is to take spectra that we obtain from our mass spectrometers and mill it through a series of commercial as well as custom-built software packages so that 
we can take data from spectral features and turn those into chemically meaningful compounds. And then ideally assign structures and names and molecular features to uh, those compounds so that we can understand something about the contaminant burden. So how do you actually visualize such data? Uh, this is one way, uh, we can use a heat map. So this is an example of a subset of the non-targeted analysis that we conducted on these Hurricane Florence samples. All of the columns represent individual samples and they're color coded at the top according to your river basin, whether it's the Noose or the Cape Fear, and according to sampling date, uh, whether it's September in the blue or in October in the orange. Um, the blue areas on this heat map represent high intensity, the red indicate low intensity. And you can see that there's a wide uh, variety of intensity profiles for all of the compounds. Each individual row in this uh, heat map is a different molecule. Uh, so overall, we were able to discern about 2,300 compounds in our samples. 640-ish of those had uh, what I would call probable identity assigned based on spectral match. And these here are this, what I'm showing here is that 641 compounds that we were able to discern a probable identity. So we can look into this data and we can learn something about the contaminant profiles and where they're coming from. I'll show some examples. So here's an example uh, along our map uh, uh, for our sampling of sucralose. <clears throat> so for those of you who don't uh, know what sucralose is, uh, this is Splenda. So anytime you uh, drink coffee with Splenda or uh, use Splenda as an artificial sweetener in your foods, uh, you're ingesting uh, this chlorinated sucralose, uh, sucrose molecule, which is uh, chemically named sucralose. Uh, this turns out to be one of the very best wastewater tracers uh, that there is. Um, so, uh, and, and you can see actually here that uh, the, uh, if you look down the Noose River from up near Raleigh, all the way down to the Noose Estuary here at N9, during normal flow conditions, this is in October after the hurricane has passed, you can see that you have high levels up here uh, near Raleigh, and then you see a steady decreasing until finally you see a very dramatic drop down here at N9 uh, due to estuarine mixing. This is because of the decreasing influence of wastewater in these uh, rivers as we flow from highly populated areas down into very uh, relatively low population areas. Um, and if we contrast that to the situation during the hurricane on 9-19-18 during the flooding, you can see that overall, uh, first of all, in the Cape Fear River, we see very low signals for sucralose, uh, confirming that this is predominantly a industrially dominated uh, river, so there's not a lot of, of municipal wastewater dumped here. Uh, and we see overall lower levels of sucralose in the Noose River, with the exception of one site here at N3. And so uh, this had us uh, scratching our head a little bit, what's going on? There must be something happening between site N2 and N3, right up here in the upper reaches of the Noose. Sure enough, if we looked into, um, uh, did some investigation, turns out that about 100,000 gallons of untreated wastewater uh, was spilled in Johnston County, uh, which was right between sample N2 and N3 on the Noose River. Here's the Johnston County Wastewater Treatment Plant. Um, they like to build these plants, I guess, uh, at sort of the low point in the community, which is right by the river, which is great for flowing into the receiving water, but not so great when the entire river floods due to the hurricane. Uh, and it turns out that this wastewater treatment plant was completely inundated and completely flooded, washed out all the settling basins into the river. Uh, so, um, so a lot of wastewater uh, uh, was, was released. And that is uh, most likely the signature of where that sucralose is coming from uh, in that river signature. And we actually went back and looked at the uh, surfactant profile around these samples and that lead, lends some uh, evidence also to release of relatively poorly treated sewage uh, into the river during that time. Another way that we can analyze this data is to do differential analysis. So here we take all of our samples that were collected during the hurricane flooding and then the samples from the same sites a month later and we look at the ratio of the intensities of compounds that were detected in both sets. And we can, uh, we can create a volcano plot where all of the compounds, each dot here is a, is a compound, uh, all the compounds that are contained in the red box uh, had intensity profiles that were higher in the samples during flooding 
And all of the ones in the green box were higher uh, intensity profiles during normal conditions. We could take a look and, and see if we can learn something about these molecules. So uh, compounds that were higher during flooding included some natural products like uh, scopoletin and nobiletin. These are actually uh, plant-derived compounds, which are likely due to basically inundation of, again, these uh, agricultural areas uh, with, uh, with floodwaters. We also see industrial chemicals like benzothiazole. In this case, actually, this is most likely a, a stormwater tracer. These are oftentimes used as vulcanization additives in rubber. And if we take a look in, uh, at what compounds are higher in normal conditions, we see that these are dominated in some cases by agrochemicals like atrazine uh, transformation products and simazine. Not surprising uh, since this area is so dominated by agriculture with corn, tobacco, and other materials. And then sometimes we see uh, other compounds which are a little bit of a mystery. So this compound in the upper left is fluoridone. Um, this actually had us scratching our head for a little while because we don't typically see this in rivers. Um, so what is this compound? Fluoridone is actually an aquatic herbicide that's often used to clear algae from ornamental ponds and, and fountains. So its trade name is sonar. Um, so the question is, what is it doing in the Noose River? So if we take a look at the profile down the Noose River here, uh, during the flood conditions, it's actually quite low, right? So very, very low intensity. So it's obviously being diluted during the flooding. During normal flow conditions, however, it's relatively high up near Raleigh, and then you see a decreasing profile until finally it's diluted away in the estuary at sample N9. So I did some research, and it turns out that uh, this compound was actually being intentionally applied in the Eno River upstream of Falls Lake near Raleigh. Falls Lake is the uh, drinking water supply for the city of Raleigh. Uh, the Eno River has had tr uh, trouble with invasive species of hydrilla. And so the New York City, or sorry, the, the North Carolina uh, uh, DEQ was actually adding fluoridone as an aquatic herbicide to the Eno River upstream of the Noose River. So Eno is right about there. So they were applying fluoridone here. It was flowing into Falls Lake, out the dam, and down the Noose River. And we were able to pick up that signature all the way down here, uh, 100 miles away from the, um, uh, from the point at which it was applied. Uh, so this Wait, really I'm just going to do a time check with you. Okay. All right. So great. I'm just about uh, two more minutes. Two more minutes. Okay. So just about done. Um, I just want to, uh, I'm not going to uh, steal Ezra's uh, thunder here uh, because she's going to talk quite a bit about PFAS, but we were able to actually find, find perfluorinated alkyl substances in some of these samples. Um, and the way we do this is using uh, a technique called mass defect filtering, where we can actually use a practical application of Einstein's E equals MC squared to find compounds that have a slight difference in mass uh, between the int nearest integer and their decimal uh, exact mass. And so if that decimal exact mass difference is negative, that's probably a fluorinated compound. So we can pick these out. And sure enough, during flooding conditions, we found uh, emerging PFAS compounds here uh, down near the Kimor's manufacturing plant, indicating that these compounds were likely being washed out from industrial production into the river. And these include things like Gen X and other emerging PFAS. And then finally, we were able to see uh, PFAS compounds both during flooding, but then at higher levels under normal conditions along the Noose River, highest actually here in the estuarine uh, site at N9. And of course, that's opposite from what we were seeing with sucralose, which was higher here. So this compound must have a different source. Sure enough, I don't have time to show it to you, but I, I can tell you that we went back in this site right here is the Marine Corps Air Station at Cherry Point. Um, it turns out that the uh, aqueous film forming firefighting foams at this uh, Marine Corps Air Station are responsible for these high levels of uh, perfluorooctane sulfonate and other PFOS here in these estuarine areas. Okay, so just to wrap up, um, so Hurricane Florence really was unprecedented. It's flooding in eastern North Carolina. Uh, we were able to use non-targeted analysis of these uh, water samples to, to really trace back which types of compounds were impacting the floodwaters during this storm event. Uh, untreated wastewater, stormwater contaminants, and natural products. Uh, we found lots of emerging contaminants in these uh, that were lower in the flooding impacted river water than during no normal flow conditions. So this was indicating dilution. And we found some surprises like uh, fluoridone in the Noose River uh, that, that's uh, actually coming from, from far upstream. And then of course the emerging PFAS compounds that we're seeing 
uh, in the Cape Fear River. Um, so just uh, for relevance to, to uh, San Francisco Bay, I just want to make sure and reiterate that we have been using non-targeted analysis as a way to prioritize CECs in San Francisco Bay water. This is a study we did in 2016 uh, up, uh, where we were able to identify compounds in the Napa River, San Leandro Bay, and Coyote Creek, including lots of stormwater derived uh, tracers uh, that you'll hear about later probably from uh, Ed Kolodzie, Professor Ed Kolodzie. Uh, so with that, thank you for your attention. Thanks so much. I'm going to introduce our next speaker. Um, Dr. Dan Villeneuve is a research toxicologist with US EPA's Office of Research and Development. He received a BS in water resources and zoology from the University of Wisconsin, Stevens Point, and a PhD in zoology and environmental toxicology from Michigan State University. He has over 20 years of experience conducting freshwater ecotoxicology research. His present research is focused on the use of new approach methods to characterize and evaluate the hazards organic contaminants pose to fish and wildlife with a current focus on the Great Lakes and other freshwater systems. Dr. Villeneuve joined the Emerging Contaminants Workgroup Advisory Panel this year to provide expertise on toxicology. Dan, you ready to share your screen? Yes, I am. Okay. Thank you for the introduction and it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, it's my first year with the RMP and really a pleasure to uh, be on board and advising how we can bring some of these new approach methods into the prioritization of these contaminants of emerging concern. So when folks like Lee go out and use their uh, high resolution mass spectrometer and so on to measure 640 compounds out in the receiving waters, you know, the question of course comes up, well, should we be concerned about these contaminants? Um, what are their potential effects? We know there are many different sources of contaminants and as analytical methods and instrumentation improve, improve we're detecting more and more of these chemicals in our surface waters. As we get to using non-target analyses, we're also detecting a variety of transformation, breakdown, and degradation related products that probably haven't really looked at much in, in previous times. And so to move that into a risk-based uh, framework to help prioritize and understand whether we need to be concerned about these contaminants or not, um, we need to marry that chemical detection, that exposure information with corresponding toxicity information. And unfortunately, for many of these compounds that are being detected, um, first of all, there's no existing water quality criteria or standards that have been established. Um, that's often because there's little or, more, little or no toxicity data for many of these compounds. And it's not really a, a viable solution to generate new toxicity data, at least in the near term, because um, it can take gen years to generate that new data um, for these novel compounds. We often don't have the legal authority to go out demand that somebody collects those data. And so our, while it's been effective, our traditional toxicity testing paradigm of basically exposing organisms to the chemical, characterizing the concentra concentrations at which we see various adverse effects and doing that for a variety of representative taxa um, simply isn't efficient, cost effective enough and so on to keep pace with the number of chemicals that we potentially have to assess and generate these data for. And I think the PFAS uh, example that Lee mentioned, you know, they detect a number of PFAS structures. This is sort of a classic case of, you know, what we're dealing with in terms of CECs. So we've got somewhere on the order of three to 5,000 different PFAS structures out there in commerce. Um, only a handful of those actually do we have the data that would be necessary to meet the minimum data requirements for developing a water quality criteria or standard. And if you look across PFAS, there are 
certain PFAS structures for which there is a fairly good amount of toxicity information, particularly PFOS and PFOA. But by and large, once you get beyond these couple well-studied uh, representatives of perfluorinated compounds, the vast majority of compounds in this class actually have little or no toxicity data. And so that forces us into a situation where we have to use either much more efficient methods to generate toxicity information for these chemicals, or we have to use predictive approaches that can rely on things like chemical structures and the ability to put chemicals into uh, classes based on like structures and, and the potential biological targets they might interact with to understand what the potential toxicological significance might be. So to help address this question of how can we generate information on the toxicity of chemicals in a more rapid and cost-effective manner, um, really within the field of toxicology, there's been a shift or a vision to move away from the traditional system based on whole animal testing, move to one that's founded primarily on the use of in vitro methods that can be administered as a suite of high predictive high throughput assays, and that these assays would focus on critical mechanistic endpoints that are involved in um, producing toxic effects without directly measuring those effects themselves. So rather than um, measuring whether fish go belly up in a tank, we're going to measure the ability of chemicals to interact with biological pathways that could lead to toxicity in those organisms. And so this program, um, use of these high throughput methods has been going on for over a decade now. Um, one of the leading programs in this area is EPA's ToxCast program and the federal, uh, US Federal Tox21 collaboration. Through those programs, um, thousands of structures have now been screened in a variety of pathway-based assays that measure things like the ability of chemicals to inhibit enzyme activities, to bind to specific receptors, to modulate gene expression or activate uh, transcription factors, to elicit changes in hormone concentrations or even looking at changes in cell morphology or changes in the behavior of small organisms. And so <clears throat> all these data are publicly available. Um, they're there for, for a large number of chemicals. And this can give us some insights into what it is these chemicals can do biologically and at what concentrations we see those effects and particularly what relative concentration we see effects on different pathways. Now, certainly we don't have comprehensive coverage for all contaminants. I mean, we don't have these data for all the thousands of PFAS chemicals. Uh, we don't have this for necessarily all 640 that Lee detected in his monitoring. Um, but we do have a, a rapidly growing database and we can add new data um, in a fairly rapid and cost-effective fashion. So in the last couple of years, um, data have been generated in these systems for over 150 novel PFAS structures. Um, and at a cost of you know, roughly $20,000 a chemical, which to put it in perspective is less than the cost of a single fish early life stage test, um, but potentially giving you a lot of information about the potential toxicity. Just to give an example of how this can help expand the amount of information relevant to toxicity that we have um, for environmental monitoring efforts. Uh, we had a study that was conducted in the Great Lakes um, basically monitoring a group of targeted analytes. So in this monitoring effort, there were 65 chemicals that were detected. Again, these are fairly commonly monitored chemicals, many of which we already had traditional toxicity benchmarks. So roughly 50% of the chemicals detected had traditional benchmarks, but that leaved, leaves another 50% for which we essentially didn't have toxicity information for that risk-based prioritization. So by just adding ToxCast data into consideration, we're actually able to increase that coverage to about 83%. Um, so again, 
helping to fill some of those data gaps when it comes to potential toxicity of these chemicals. Of course, the challenge when we actually come to utilize these data is that you know we don't regulate enzyme activities and citizens don't necessarily care about receptor binding. And so we have to be able to understand you know, what inhibition of an enzyme activity means in terms of potential effects on human health or ecosystem functions and services. Right now, you know, if you were to go to the CompTOX chemistry dashboard and look at those bioactivity profiles, it's a bit like going to the doctor and getting some tests run, the doctor just handing you those test results and telling you to go home and figure it out for yourself. I mean, certainly with enough time spent on you know, the internet and scrounging through medical journals, you could probably put the pieces together, but in general, it's much more efficient if you, you know, have the doctor's knowledge and have access to the specialized knowledge that really helps us understand what these results mean. And so to help address that issue when it comes to the use of these new approach methods, um, we've been working on a, an approach called the Adverse Outcome Pathway Framework, and the goal of this framework is to really organize and portray existing knowledge concerning the linkages between these molecular initiating events, so things like inhibition of enzyme activities, binding to receptors, those sorts of things, and then how that translates across different levels of biological organization and can cause adverse outcomes at levels of organization that we actually care about from a decision-making perspective. And so the goal of this adverse outcome pathway framework is really to synthesize information and evidence from relevant sources, from our knowledge of biology, toxicology, experimental results, and so on, and present that in a simple to follow graphical and narrative format that helps us see those connections. So this is just an example of an adverse outcome pathway. Uh, these are compiled in a knowledge base called the AOP Wiki. Um, but basically, this adverse outcome pathway lays out that inhibition of this enzyme aromatase um, can lead to decreased production of a key reproductive hormone, 17 beta estradiol. 17 beta estradiol plays a key role in the stimulating the production of egg yolk precursor proteins, vitelogenin. And <clears throat> that vitelogenin is then taken up into the oocytes of egg-laying vertebrates to basically support their reproduction. And so based on what we know about the normal biology here, we can infer that if we were to inhibit this enzyme activity or reduce the production of this hormone, we could potentially affect reproduction in egg-laying vertebrates. What we had also assemble as part of this adverse outcome pathway is evidence from studies that actually shows that this pattern of results is exactly what we see. When we expose fish to an aromatase inhibitor, we see the reduction of that hormone concentration, the egg yolk precursor proteins, reduced uptake into the oocytes, and ultimately reduced fecundity. And so we assemble that evidence, we provide that weight of evidence, and technical experts go through and review that to associate or to uh, review the support for those associations and assign a relative confidence so that somebody going to this knowledge base can understand what the connections are and what information there is to support that proposed connection. So putting these two sources of information together, um, we can get at this question of, well, what is it that this chemical can do biologically? And what does that actually mean in terms of effects that we care about? And so those are the kinds of data that we're trying to couple together to try and get at some of these questions as it relates to environmental monitoring of CECs. How do we then move that to a risk-based prioritization type of framework? So again, we're detecting these laundry lists of chemicals. We have limited resources for monitoring and assessment, so we'd really like to focus our attention on the chemicals of greatest concern um, the sites where we're most likely to see effects and the types of effects that we're actually most likely to see in the exposed organisms. And so one of the ways that we can do this really builds on some of the you know, traditional thinking for risk-based approaches. 
where we want to know something about what are the actual concentrations of our chemicals that are detected out in the environment. We want to know something about the concentrations at which they're known to cause biological effect. And then we want to know what's the probability that those two concentrations actually overlap. And so that's traditionally done using a hazard quotient based approach or, or just looking at probabilistic type risk assessment. Well, we can apply that same sort of concept to these pathway based uh, activity concentrations that come from these in vitro high throughput screening assays. So here we simply take our exposure concentration measured out in the environment. We divide that by the concentration that produces a response, a significant response in one of these pathway based assays, and we can calculate the ratio. And that ratio helps us to understand based on relative concentration and relative potency of that chemical to act on these biological pathways, what its relative priority would be or potential to cause hazard to these exposed organisms. And so this is just a simple ratio of concentrations. It's really simple in concept and it's a really simple calculation that you can do. But when you start to apply that to a list of say 600 chemicals and you've got over a thousand now different assay endpoints in the ToxCast data set, you know, quickly you're getting to having to do 195,000 or more calculations. And so to help facilitate that, um, we've developed essentially software packages. Um, and so in collaboration with USGS, we developed a package called ToxiVal. This is a R-based package. Um, basically you can take your chemical monitoring data, input that data set, already has the ToxCast database loaded into this. Um, you can also upload your own water quality benchmarks or toxicity values you might obtain from the literature. It'll calculate all these ratios. It can do things like sum all the chemicals, sum the ratios for all the chemicals in a given sample so that you can do things like lay that over a map and view for the mixtures of chemicals detected at different sites the overall exposure activity ratios summed for that whole mixture. So help you prioritize which sites you may, may, need, may want to focus on and where you have potential to cause some biological effects. There's also a variety of other visualization tools where you can look at different dimensions of the analysis. So for example, looking at which chemicals have high exposure to activity ratios across many different sites. So here we could Dan, I'm gonna give you a two minute warning. Okay. So here we can estimate our exposure activity ratios. We can set a threshold and identify those chemicals likely to produce biological effects. We can also identify the assays that are responding so we can understand what biological pathways are being impacted. And we can map those to relevant adverse outcome pathways to understand what the potential adverse effects are and what types of endpoints we might use for biomonitoring. We can also employ these approaches, these new approach methodology to say something about the contaminants that we're not necessarily identifying or uh, measuring in terms of concentration, but we know that there are other chemicals out there in these mixtures that can produce effects. So in those cases, we can actually take a sample, extract it, run it directly in some of these bioassays, um, particularly multiplex bioassays that can look at multiple different biological activities. We can then map those pathways that are impacted to the adverse outcome pathway knowledge base, filter that for the relevant taxa we're interested, for example, fish, and again, get down to predicted potential adverse effects that we might see and endpoints that we might monitor in the exposed organisms. So overall, there are a range of these predictive toxicology tools that have immediate application to environmental monitoring challenges. Um, the science here is mature, but it's also rapidly evolving. Um, this is just a very brief introduction to some of these concepts. And for anyone interested, there is detailed training available. Um, and we'd certainly welcome opportunities to uh, conduct case studies both in San Francisco Bay but other places as well.
with that, I'd just like to mention, uh, we have a number of postdoc opportunities available, particularly related to PFAS chemicals. So if you know anyone interested, please send them our way. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. I, I, I like that networking slide. Good idea. Job opportunities for our audiences out there. All right, our last speaker for this session, Dr. Ezra Miller, uh, joined the SFEI CEC's team in May of 2019 and has since been involved in several microplastics and emerging contaminants projects for the Bay RMP. He is especially excited to bring more toxicology expertise to the RMP's studies of emerging contaminants. Before joining SFEI, Ezra received a BS in chemistry and environmental science from Warren Wilson College and a PhD in molecular and environmental toxicology from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Ezra, you are already sharing your screen. Take it away. I was sharing my screen, but I forgot to unmute myself. So okay. not great. Um, <laughs> thank you for the introduction, Lisa. Um, so uh, just to add a little bit of introduction of my own, um, when I joined SFEI in May of 2019, uh, many of you met me as Liz. I just wanted to say, please don't use that name anymore, and please do not use she, her pronouns for me. My pronouns are easier. And if you're like, whoa, I don't even know what that means, here's a quick tutorial. Um, so this is an example of how you use it instead of he or she, you would use the instead of she or her, the. So I saw Ezra's talk at the annual RMP meeting. Z talked about PFAS and also how to use zero pronouns. So with that, let's talk Ezra, about Ezra, let me just say that um, the more that you talk closer to your computer, the better we hear you. Sometimes when yeah, you move away, you got perfect. Thank you. Okay. Um, so let's talk about PFAS. Uh, so PFAS are um, entering the public consciousness a lot more than many other CECs. We are seeing concerns about drinking water um, in some places, like in the Midwest, about fish consumption, and then here in California about firefighting homes. Um, and it's even made its way into Hollywood with films like Dark Waters. Uh, so what are these compounds? Um, PFAS stands for poly and perfluoroalkyl substances. Um, they're used in a wide variety of consumer products and industrial applications. And um, so there's kind of the two groups. The perfluoroalkyl substances are the older compounds that we know a lot more about. These compounds don't have any carbon hydrogen bonds, it's all fluorines, um, which makes them not susceptible to biological breakdown. But we have lots of data about them. We know that they're everywhere in the environment and we know relatively more about how they can affect organisms. And a lot of these already have management actions associated with them. Some of them are part of the Stockholm Convention. In California, just a few days ago, Governor Newsom just signed a bill um, restricting their use in firefighting foams. So in comparison, poly, uh, 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 fluoroalkyl substances are the newer, uh, more emerging contaminants. Um, these do have some carbon hydrogen bonds or other features that make them more easily transformable in the environment, although some of them do break down into the perfluoroalkyl substances. Um, these compounds, we know very little about them. So we've seen um, both Dan and Lee showed that there's lots and lots of these compounds being detected by these uh, non-targeted analysis approaches, um, but we don't really know much about their toxicity um, or where they are in the environment any, even. Um, and so it is possible that they are an example of regrettable substitution where they're um, just as toxic perhaps, we don't know, as the um, ones that they are replacing. Um, all of them are highly persistent in the environment, which makes them a concern as a contaminant. So um, we've already gotten a preview of this with Miguel's talk, but um, here again is our RMP tiered risk-based framework for contaminants of emerging concern. So um, this is based on their uh, current data compared to toxicological thresholds that are available and also other things like persistence and use patterns. 
Um, so if you were at the ECWG meeting this year, you would know um, that PFAS used to be split into two groups. Those um, perfluoroalkyl substances that we know a lot about have been in the moderate concern category for a while. But this year, we actually took all of the um, new compounds that were previously in possible concern and moved them up to the moderate concern category. This is consistent with um, worldwide understanding that all of these compounds have similar modes of action and act in, therefore act in similar ways. And so we should be looking at them as the total mixture. Um, and because of their persistence, uh, they are of a concern because they're not going away once they're entering the environment. So um, they're also bioaccumulative and toxic. So um, we know the most about uh, the long chain compounds, the uh, P things like PFOS and PFOA. So I'm gonna kind of focus on those. Um, we know that uh, in terms of bioaccumulation, PFOS tends to bioaccumulate the most compared to the other compounds. Um, most toxicity studies are on those compounds, but we do know uh, that there are different effects depending on the chemical structure and also on the species. Um, PFAS are kind of unusual in that compared to other legacy contaminants that uh, concentrate in fats, PFAS actually prefer um, sticking to proteins, so they tend to concentrate in the blood, brain, or other organs like the liver, um, although the distribution within an organism varies by the species. Um, they have diverse modes of action. They can affect reproduction, development, metabolism, and growth, which are all very important for an organism to survive. Um, and we also know that they can be maternally transferred um, either to eggs or um, to, for mammals through placenta and uh, milk to the offspring. Um, and because of all of this, we also know that the most sensitive species are those at the top of the food chain. So for aquatic food chains, this means marine mammals and um, piscivorous birds and also humans. Okay, so um, we are really lucky in the Bay to have one of the best data sets on PFAS in an ecosystem because of our Contaminants of Emerging Concern monitoring program. Um, and because we were monitoring them and finding levels that were of concern, that led to more uh, monitoring for these compounds, which means that we have a really great data set. Um, a lot of this work was done by Meg Sedlak, so big shout out to her. Um, she no longer works for SFEI because she has moved on to doing really important political work, but um, many of you have interacted with her and I just wanted to uh, thank her for all of this amazing data. So um, starting out with PFAS in water, the last time this was monitored was in 2009, 2010. Um, in general, most of this data is just targeted monitoring for um, about 13 to 15 PFAS compounds. Um, and these are all like those uh, longer chain, less emerging, but still emerging <laughs> compounds. Um, in the water, PFOA was actually detected at the highest concentrations. And um, just this year, California released, or there were, the Water Board released um, environmental screening levels for um, PFAS and PFOA. So these are concentrations in water that may be a uh, concern for ecotoxicity or for human health via um, ingestion of seafood. And you can tell from comparing these ESLs to our um, past data water concentrations that for ecotoxicity, the levels are below a level that might be of concern, but for human health, they're quite a bit higher than the levels that might be of concern. So what about in fish? We are lucky to have data for both prey fish and sport fish. Um, the prey fish data is from 2009 to like 2013, and then the sport fish data is from 2014. Um, this is, the map shows prey fish data. Um, the PFOS was the most highly detected compound in the tissue, so that's what the map is. Um, and uh, in California, we don't have threshold uh, thresholds uh, for uh, concern for these compounds, but Canada does. So um, 
we'll use those, <laughs> those uh, environmental quality guidelines um, to protect, protect um, fish eating birds and marine mammals. And you can see that our um, crayfish and even our sport fish concentrations are actually higher than those quality guidelines. So that, there is another point of some concern. Um, in terms of sport fish, humans eat sport fish. So um, once again, California does not have uh, uh, consumption advisories for PFAS, but some other states do. Um, so these are just a few examples. It's based on how many meals a month or a week you can eat based on how much PFAS is in the fish. Um, so you can see that our highest uh, sport fish concentrations are in the range where in some other states that would be considered a concern and you would want to reduce your level of fish consumption. Um, what about in the creatures that eat the fish? Um, so we know that uh, in birds, PFAS compounds cause um, developmental toxicity, specifically to um, the egg development and hatching success. Um, so there have been a number of studies on PFAS effects on egg hatching and a few studies on other compounds that show that the other compounds have similar effects. Um, but what I want to highlight here is that the different studies have pretty different threshold uh, end values associated with them. So what level of concentration is a concern? So in the Bay, we've been monitoring um, PFAS and cormorant eggs for quite a while. Um, so this graph shows PFOS and PFOA. Um, and biological data can be pretty variable, but it does appear that there's a trend of decreasing PFOS, um, but kind of similar levels of PFOA, although the PFOA levels are lower than the PFOS levels, once again. Um, if we overlay those thresholds that I had on the previous slide, um, we can start to think about how this might be affecting the cormorant populations. Depending on which threshold you choose, we may be above or below the threshold, but I just want to point out that these thresholds are pretty gross um, endpoints of not ha the egg eggs not hatching. Um, that doesn't uh, necessarily consider um, more subtle effects that could still over time affect bird populations things like the neurodevelopment, their bird's immune system, or ability to uh, metabolize different compounds. So there's still a possibility of effects of these compounds on our bay birds. Um, in terms of marine mammals, uh, PFAS are actually able to do long range transport, which means that they can end up in places very far from where they're released. So a lot of them are actually in the Arctic. Um, and so there's been quite a bit of study on things like polar bears, which luckily are not particularly relevant to San Francisco Bay. But we know that um, from these studies that these compounds are linked to um, changes in hormone function and uh, homeostasis. We also know from studies of uh, dolphins that these compounds are linked with things like uh, changes to immune activation and that corresponds to how susceptible these organisms are to disease. And this is further supported by um, more correlative evidence in California um, of dead otters that uh, the more <laughs> uh, PFAS and PFOA these otters had in their systems, they, those otters also tended to be um, the ones that showed more signs of disease. So it's not a, a causation study necessarily, but it does lend some weight of evidence to this uh, cause for concern. Um, in the Bay, we have seals, and um, we've actually measured uh, various PFAS compounds in seals, and those concentrations are similar to concentrations of um, some of these compounds that have been linked to changes in liver function in both um, lab cell studies and then also wild Baikal seals, which is, those are seals that live in a lake in Russia called Lake Baikal. 
Um, okay, so we have all of this information that tells us that there's probably some low level effects happening to our bay um, organisms. So what's, what are we doing now with this information? Well, we're really interested in thinking about pathways. Um, so we're in the middle of a multi-year uh, big stormwater study for a lot of different kinds of CECs, including PFAS. We're also interested in updating a lot of these um, bay loading data that are pretty old. So like um, from 10 plus years ago. Uh, and so um, we're, we collected sport fish and had them analyzed for PFAS last year. That data is coming really soon. Um, then we're doing water and bird eggs again next year, and then sport fish again in 2024. Um, like I said, we're also interested in pathways. The water board uh, just issued new requirements for wastewater treatment plants to monitor for these compounds. Um, and here in region two, uh, BACWA, the Bay Area Clean Water Association, is organizing and funding a study that SFEI will be leading that will allow us to do more interesting science than just is this here or not um, at uh, POTWs here in the Bay Area. Um, something that we don't have funding for but are interested in potentially doing is future work. Um, Many of these compounds that we've been monitoring are not the only PFAS. Um, as uh, Lee showed in his slides, there are lots and lots of these compounds. Other groups have shown that if you measure the total amount of fluorine compared to just the target PFAS that are usually monitored, you see a lot more. So we may have higher exposures than we think we do for a lot of um, these compounds. And of course, mixture effects are completely unknown. So that's something that we're interested in exploring more at some point in the future. So um, take home messages. We know that these compounds are widespread in the San Francisco Bay food web. Uh, PFOS tends to be the most abundant in organisms and uh, may, these compounds may be posing risks to wildlife, but we do also see um, some declines in our data that we have multiple years for, especially of PFAS. Um, we just still don't know a lot about the occurrence of many of these other types of PFAS chemicals besides the ones that are routinely targeted for, um, and we don't know much about mixtures either. Our study priorities are uh, focusing on the pathways, so stormwater and wastewater, and then updating our water, fish, and bird concentrations so we can know the, the current present uh, situation with those. So um, you may be wondering, okay, but what about what can I do to help? Um, so PFAS are used in a ton of things because they're really useful compounds, but um, that means that you kind of need to start thinking uh, carefully about what kinds of things you're consuming um, if you're worried about these. So this isn't to scare you, just to, some examples of things that you can do to help decrease PFAS in the bay. Um, so some of these are really easy, like microwave popcorn is easy to avoid purchasing or eating. Um, I don't ever do that, but I definitely do own outdoor gear, like a raincoat that I use on a regular basis. Um, so it's kind of a balancing act. I think that Governor Newsom's bill that just got signed also included a ban of using these compounds in some cosmetics in addition to firefighting foam. Um, and then San Francisco, I have to give a shout out to them for banning PFAS in compostable food packaging. Um, that's linked to their efforts to reduce single use plastics. Um, but yay, there's no PFAS in their food packaging that's compostable. Um, if you're like, I have no idea how to tell if PFAS are in various compounds or various products, um, there's lots of resources available on the internet for um, figuring out which products may contain these compounds and how to avoid them. Uh, so here's a couple of examples. And contact info if you have questions, and I think I will turn it back over to Louisa for the discussion. Thank you, Ezra, Dan, and Lee. If you could all put back your 
uh, unmute yourselves. Um, we will begin the Q&A session of our Emerging Contaminants um, panel. Um, so we, we were worried we weren't going to get a lot of questions. They kind of took a while to come in, but in the last few minutes, they have been, uh, they've been coming in. Um, so thank you all very much um, for your presentations. Um, just quickly, will the slides be available later? Yes, all, all of this uh, session is being recorded. Um, the entire day is being recorded. Um, I think the speakers are making available their individual talks as well. So on the SFEI website, I'm sure you will find lots of information on um, how you can relook at everybody's presentations. Um, first question for Ezra from Mike Connor. Uh, most of the fish, birds, and mammals that are high in PFAS are also high in PCBs, dioxins, and PPDEs. How does the relative risk from PFAS compare to those other contaminants? So the easiest answer is I have no idea. <laughs> um, but that's a really good point. Um, we actually, toxicology has historically tested just one single compound uh, on organisms and then said, okay, that's the threshold. But in the environment, we have crazy mixtures of lots and lots of different types of contaminants, which have different types of effects. So some of these may affect different um, systems within an organism in such a way where they don't necessarily interact at all. Others may affect the same adverse outcome pathway, in which case they may have additive effects or they may cancel each other out. Um, but we really have very, very little data on how they interact. In terms of like comparing which is worse, PFAS or PCBs, that's also kind of difficult to do. Um, they might have different effects, uh, <laughs> or they uh, they may have different effects on like uh, organisms that may lead to population level effects, which is maybe what you're concerned about. Um, I would say that in general, we're probably thinking more about the legacy contaminants like PCBs as um, they would be kind of like in the, the high uh, tier of our tiered risk based framework, whereas PFAS are in the medium concerned tier. Um, but for some of these other compounds, it's more up in the air. PBDEs we have in general um, in the low risk tier in the Bay because we know that um, mitigation actions are decreasing their levels, except for in certain places. Um, in that case, I would say maybe PFAS are more of a concern, but there's lots of different like ways to compare them. I'm not sure how directly comparable they are, but like I said, we really know very little about mixture effects and that is kind of a, the biggest concern that your question brings up. And I'm sorry that I couldn't just give you an easy answer. <laughs> None of this is easy, so that makes sense. Um, I have a question. It's actually a clarification from David Jenkins to, um, to Lee. You stated that sucralose was a good municipal wastewater tracer. Since I understand that sucralose has limited biodegradability and removal in wastewater treatment processes, it should trace both treated and untreated municipal wastewater rather than solely untreated wastewater. Is this correct? Okay, yeah, no, that's a very uh, good question and, uh, and a good opportunity for clarification. Um, so David's exactly right. Uh, sucralose is, uh, is a good tracer for wastewater uh, predominantly because it's not degraded very efficiently in, um, in most biological processes. And so that's true that uh, the concentrations that would be seen in, in treated effluent are gonna be very, very similar to that which you would see in untreated wastewater. So it's not a marker specifically for untreated wastewater. Um, in, in the case of the example that I showed in my presentation where we were observing high, uh, a, a spike of sucralose downstream of a plant uh, under the storm uh, water conditions from Hurricane Florence, uh, that was basically a case where we knew there had to be a point source input and it had to be sort of uh, over and above what the dilution was giving us for the rest of the watershed. And we were actually, I didn't show the data, but we were able to use a different tracer for untreated wastewater, which is polyethoxylated surfactants. So 
uh, alcohol polyethoxylates are typically very, very well degraded in wastewater, uh, conventional biological wastewater treatment. And when you see those in wastewater, it's usually a good indication that either the plant's not working correctly or that it's untreated wastewater. And in this case, we were actually able to pick up the signature of polyethoxylated surfactants in those same samples that we saw the high sucralose levels for. Um, we, we have a question um, that honestly I'm just going to restate um, because I, I'm not sure who it's to. Fluoridine, what other species of plants could it be impacting downriver and in the estuary with unintended consequences? Is that a follow-up study or is this really very targeted to hydrilla? Maybe this is to lead. Yeah, I think that was for me as well. Uh, fluoridone was the compound we found in the Noose River unexpectedly. Yeah, so that was actually, that. that's the question. That is the question. Uh, what could be the effects downstream? Um, to us, it was a bit uh, alarming to observe it in such a uh, distance from the application site and especially through a, uh, uh, past a, a drinking water reservoir. Uh, we don't know anything about the removal efficiency in drinking water um, treatment for this compound, and we don't know anything about what the other sort of non-target effects might be on plants in the watershed. Um, I, I do know that it was targeted quite specifically to hydrilla for application, but I'd be very surprised if it did not have um, non-targeted effects on other aquatic plants. So I'm not sure whether it's, it's toxic to uh, single-celled algae, um, but there may be effects on, on other kinds of, of algae and, and plants downstream in the watershed. Uh, I will state, however, that remember this is non-targeted analysis data, so there was, we did not quantify uh, the fluoridone. So we, we actually don't know what the concentrations uh, we were observing are. I was estimating that they were in the, um, in the part, high part per trillion to low part per billion uh, concentrations. Um, a question for Dan, are there good examples of predictive toxic, predictive tox methods identifying chemicals that are problems in the Great Lakes? Um, yeah, so within the Great Lakes, we have been employing kind of the approach that I was talking about today um, using exposure activity ratios. So we've actually collected about 10 years worth of monitoring data and we have been using that exposure activity ratio approach. Um, we have, based on that, identified a number of priority contaminants that you know, we targeted for further monitoring and management. And we've sort of done that piecemeal looking at specific systems or specific years of monitoring um, we're actually going through the effort right now to apply that to the whole data set for the last 10 years. And so hopefully we'll be pushing those data out within the next year or two. Um, but, you know, certainly we're, we're using that to help set priorities for what we might want to elevate to the International Joint Commission for potential inclusion on their CMC or Chemicals of Mutual Concern list. Um, so, it, you know, these are methods are being employed. Could I add uh, maybe a tiered question on top of that? You were saying, so you're going back and using the past 10 years worth of data to help feed the model. And then there are just so much uncertainty now with climate change effects, episodic events. How confident can you be in the model that using the last 10 years of data will give us the answers that we need in the next 10 years with data we don't have? Yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure we can be real confident in that. And, you know, hopefully the goal is that as we start to um, detect new compounds that we can gain toxicity information for them more quickly and start to utilize these methods as we have the data to do it. But, you know, again, predicting the future has always been a challenging game. And so, uh, um, you know, I can only speculate as to how effective we might be at predicting what's going to come next. But, 
but I do think the combination of you know, both the databases that are growing for these chemicals of emerging concern, as well as the ability to deploy some of these tools to directly evaluate samples and mixtures and use that to kind of hone in on chemical classes or particular pathway effects that are of interest um, can help us point in the right direction. Um, but yeah, that's about all I, I can offer at this time. And I guess, you know, the question that came up about the fluoridine points out, I think, a particular gap right now in new approach methods, and that is for species like plants where, you know, the current high throughput testing battery has no consideration of plants whatsoever. Um, and so that's a big gap in terms of our evaluation for potential effects on ecosystems. And so, you know, there are efforts just beginning to try and fill some of those gaps in the high throughput screening programs and develop the appropriate assays to cover that space, to cover things like invertebrates. But right now that is a major limitation of kind of the NAMS approaches for environmental monitoring. Um, one more follow-up, um, also coming from Mike Connor, pointing out that Puget Sound and SFEI have been seeing bigger issues with tire degradation products um, from in, in stormwater from, from road runoff. Um, is that an issue in the Great Lakes? Have you guys started looking at it? Uh, it's not an issue that we've looked at a great deal in the Great Lakes area, although given what I've heard about you know, kind of what SFEI and collaborators have found, I imagine it's going to be something that's going to be looked at in the very near future. Um, but it's an example of something that hasn't been high on the radar. You know, one of the major emphases in recent years in the Great Lakes area has been uh, coal tar sealants and runoff of pHs from coal tar, coal tar sealants and really establishing those as a is a major source of pH contamination in these systems and trying to eliminate that source. But, you know, certainly the road runoff and tire particle issues emerging. Um, a question back to Lee in terms of planning ahead for you are able to mobilize and, and get samples after a, a major flooding event. Um, we anticipate as much as we are dealing with fire season now that um, we will have our own flooding season. What, what advice do you have in terms of helping us plan for sampling in the way that you did after such an event in our urbanized estuary? Sure, okay. Um, yeah, logistically, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, and so we are, ours was quite um, a fire drill, I, I have to say. We were not prepared uh, when this happened for, to, to do the work. Uh, we sort of threw together uh, our sampling protocol um, sort of in an ad hoc way. Since then, we've been much more intentional about having a uh, sort of a rapid sampling response kit that essentially we keep ready to go uh, if we have this sort of um, situation where we need to go out and, and collect samples rapidly. And so I, my best advice is to have basically a, a contingency plan with um, basically sites pre-selected and uh, sampling containers pre-cleaned and staged. Uh, and that's how, we, that's how we're uh, addressing it um, for, for this. And the logistics of actually getting to the sites when floodwaters block the roads were, were difficult. So um, perhaps SFBI has a helicopter, uh, but we did not. So, um, but uh, it, 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 in all seriousness, uh, access to the sites is, is one of the most difficult um, uh, aspects. Great, thank you. We have time for one more question. Um, Maybe Ezra, if you wouldn't mind taking point, the question is related to refineries, contributions from refineries or firefighting activities on, on the PFAS load or PFAS contributions. Do you have any advice um, on that for Andrea Ventura is asking the question? Yeah, so I think I maybe forgot to mention this, but a lot of our data shows what we would expect that wastewater treatment uh, highly impacted areas uh, have higher concentrations, but we also see higher concentrations in the North Bay that could potentially be related to the refineries. Um, we have a proposal to monitor North Bay margin sediment, but we don't have funding 
for that um, monitoring yet. So that's another way that we could uh, figure that out. Um, and then I also just wanted to highlight again that um, the new bill SB 1044 that just got signed um, is banning PFAS firefighting foams starting in January of 2022. So um, hopefully that uh, mitigation strategy will also decrease this input of PFAS from firefighting foams in the future and make it less of a contribution. And I could add that the next phase of the state board's statewide investigation of PFAS sources will target petroleum refineries and storage terminal facilities. So there is a, there will be a, an investigation order coming, going public soon. So there will be data generated on petroleum refineries soon. Great, thank you, Tom. Excellent, thank you to all our esteemed speakers. Thank you so, so much. I always learn a lot. Um, to keep us on time, I think I'm turning it over back to Melissa and or Tom. Great. Thanks, Louisa, and thank you, Lee, Dan, and Ezra, for another session of great talk. Uh, we will take a 10-minute break, maybe a nine-minute break, and we'll come back at, at 2.30 for the last session of the day, uh, Urban Stormwater Runoff. It's going to be great, so don't miss it, and we'll see you soon.